like this scam I just received. Apparently I've got a long lost wealthy benefactor. I, I keep getting ones wanting me to invest in Bitcoin. Oh my God, how annoying. And look at this one. I apparently owe the tax office thousands of extra dollars on my hex loan. <sighs> yeah, good one. How gullible do they think I am? <gasps> um, I don't think that's a scam. Elon Musk's SpaceX Starship rocket exploded minutes after launch, an underwhelming performance from the world's biggest rocket to say the least. Speaking of flops, let's head over to our culture critic for details on a show with no audience. Thanks Styles. This week I'm reviewing a horror film called Resurrecting the Dead. I speak of course about the iconic Australian TV series Neighbours. It was just last year when Neighbours bid the world farewell bowing out with an extravagant finale, with plenty of loved ones saying their final goodbyes before the show was graciously put down after almost 37 years on air. Or so we thought, because just like the plot lines of so many of its characters, Neighbours is back from the dead. With production having started back up in Melbourne last week, this is wonderful news for the cast, the crew, and that one viewer who still watches the show. Look, faking your own death to gain huge amounts of publicity may be uh, controversial to some, but personally, I'm all for the drama. And remember, this isn't the first time the show has been resurrected. After being killed as a baby by Channel 7 back in the 80s, before being picked up by Channel 10. In fact, thank God Neighbours got picked up again, a saving grace to Misha Barton as she joins the cast to save her, well, dead career. So, here's to another 37 years of Neighbours filled with friends, families, and shooting people in the back with a bow and arrow. Don't worry, he's alright. Well, not really. He did die, but just like the show, I'm sure he'll be alive and well by the end of the year. While I, like the rest of Australia, won't be watching, in honour of Ramsey Street's third life, I give this reboot three Lazarus stars. Hmm. Curious. Now let's head over to our local hot mess for some sisterhood solidarity. Oh, guys, I'm a girl's girl. I'm all about supporting the ladies and one girl boss in particular has caught my attention of late. Former Greens and current independent senator Lydia Thorpe. Girly pop has been getting smashed by the media lately and as someone who's used to being smashed I kind of empathise with her. She went to a strip club for a friend's 50th birthday which is a sleigh birthday if I've ever heard of one but she kind of girl bossed a bit too close to the sun when she claimed she was provoked by a group of men who disagreed with her opinions on indigenous affairs and Lydia well she was not going to take any crap from those men and said her piece in a very appropriate and composed manner in case you missed it. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Solid insults. But the media has not been kind to my girl of late, with every news outlet covering the night within an inch of its life. To the point where Sky News wrote an article slamming the ABC simply because they decided not to cover it. But thankfully, Jackie Lambie, another outspoken female politician, came to Lydia's defence to protect her from all the hate. If you do not think you're in a good way, then go and do what the rest of us do and go and get some counselling or psychology. <sighs> The media loves pitting women against each other, babe. Why give them the ammo? Anyway, this kind of media attention is not new for Thorpe, especially not in the last six weeks. After removing herself from the Greens party, then being removed from the cement at Mardi Gras, dropping an F-bomb in the Senate and being dragged from an anti-trans rally by police after storming the event in protest, calling Senator Holly Hughes out for racism in Parliament after she questioned an acknowledgement to country and not to mention the inquiry that happened into her dating history with a former bikey boss. And in some ways, I, I, I kind of relate to her. We both like kissing bad boys. We both had men say we need psychiatric help. I think there are obvious issues uh, that need to be dealt with uh, in terms of uh, her um, her health issues. And we both like to hurl small penis as an insult. That
that's why I'm 100% behind you, babe. What our country needs are people we can emulate, who speak their truths and don't give a rats about haters. Oh, dinner deck time. <laughs> oh, it's, it's that guy. <laughs> Glad you found a kindred spirit, love. Well, now let's head over to Karen Govech from Neighbourhood Watch to see how she keeps her neck of the woods in order. This week, I was more than mortified when I became aware of Eastern Health's skeletons in the closet. No, literally, skeletons, bones, human remains were found at Eastern Health's corporate offices in Melbourne. The bone room, as it has been coined, was discovered by an employee who noticed a suspicious fluid leaking into the hallway. I really just can't wrap my head around how such a heinous mistake could be made by such an esteemed health organisation. How could they be so negligent and not even attempt to cover up the crime? Their manager needs a talking to. Because negligence is one thing, but carelessness is another. Take a note out of my book, because an organisation like the Neighbourhood Watch would never be caught committing such an act. Even though our work is pro bono, we still dispose of all emotional baggage and biohazardous waste appropriately when we settle neighbourhood disputes that cannot quite be solved with mediation alone. Anywho, I have a bone to pick with Eastern Health because their behaviour is unacceptable and I will not tolerate it. <laughs> Karen Gavetch, your go-to person for all body disposal needs. Now time to head out and about with our finance bro Barry Martin. I'm guessing you heard the new Melbourne Airport Rail has been delayed again till after 2029. Yep, Melbourne Airport is still in negotiations and the bloody doll bludgers are up in arms about it. I mean, it's half the cost of a decent bottle of red to catch a cab or park at the airport. They can't even shell it for that. Dad always said to make do with what you got, like when he had to drive the Beamer in until he could afford the Benz. My Benz now, by the way. So that's why I've decided to conduct a little experiment. See if I can get from my apartment in Turak to Melbourne Telemarine Airport using the current public transport system that Dick did a Dan so proud of. Oh, um, I forgot to download that app you were telling me about. What was it? PTV. <laughs> Dear Lord, <laughs> we'll keep tabs on Barry's progress throughout the episode, but for now we're off to a short break. Yabba dabba do. Let's now check in on our ever so slightly right wing free thinker Foxy Sky. This week I'm angry and I'm directing my anger towards the most pertinent issues facing our society. Water bottles and South Australians. Last week Dan Andrews uh, confirmed a paid incentive scheme for plastic bottle recycling will start in Victoria this November. Well, guess what? You'll probably never guess, but I don't trust it. South Australia has been paying its residents 10 cents per plastic bottle since 1975. In fact, people return around 600 million drink containers each year. And you know why? South Australians have had to buy their water bottles because their tap water sucks. Don't think we don't know what you're up to, South Australia. You have been drinking bottled water for 50 years and you say things like, plant and trance. Well, I've got a theory. Dan Andrews is encouraging us to cash in our water bottles for a reason. The reason, people, is so that he can slowly poison us with the water. Wake up! Why do you think he wants to pay us for these water bottles? It's because they're filled with Chinese, nuclear submarine, communist, COVID-ridden, Russian propaganda, socialist work agenda, ABC journalism particles. I'll only be drinking my water from paper cups from now on. Those particles will rot our brains into wokeness. What's next? No pronouns in Parliament? What? I told you those South Australian scumbags were psychopaths. Dan Andrews better not do that. Without pronouns, how will I know where to hurl my misogyny? Little South Australia, the minority state, will start dictating how we speak and what we drink. The next press conference, Dan is going to start speaking like a posh South Australian bogan. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll dance on his grave. 
I'm gonna go do a coffee run. Do you want anything? Yes, just just the usual. I'll give you some loose change. Oh, thanks. Okay. Yay, thank you. Right then, let's see who's been cheating on who in the world of international affairs. Oh my, my, my. This week, let's focus on the strategies of the master of seduction, China. He knows his way around the body of politics and has perfected the two-pronged attack, fighting the unmet need and then filling it in a way that's never been filled before. Case in point, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Those two have been fighting for seven years, and that's putting it lightly. Embassies were closed, ties were cut, but now, with China's help, those two are getting back together, promising to respect each other's state sovereignty and stop meddling in the internal affairs. I mean, wow, nobody does it like China. Even North Korea may be falling under China's spell. What? Their new ballistic missile is alarming the neighborhood. Apparently, the world is looking for see himself to calm Kim down. Ugh, that baby. If he doesn't like the US, South Korea, and Japan's menage a trois, then attend a therapy sesh and talk about your avoidant attachment. Launching a missile cannot replace a love you're missing from your people. Be civilized and attend therapy. Sage words. Right, time to change things up and check out some outfits with none other than our fashion nun. Hi sisters. It seems once again we've reached that time of year when celebrities and influencers across the globe desperately crawl their way to the California desert with one goal in mind. Instagram pics. And to attend the Coachella Music Festival. It seems the journey is also a treacherous one with some not surviving. But fear not, everyone's favourite fashion devout nun was able to make it, despite previous criminal activity within the US. I'm referring to me, of course. I wore my best fits, took a few sneaky pics for the gram, and then sat back to enjoy the festival, patiently waiting for Frank Ocean. But it seemed Brother Frank had other plans. For his debut return to the stage after six years, Brother Frank had audiences waiting over an hour and then proceeded to give the greatest tragedy of the century. A lacklustre performance with not even a single cock ring in sight. The performance was so dead, he even put Justin Bieber to sleep. Why oh why did Brother Frank give such an underwhelming performance? Look into your hearts and you'll find the truth as I have. Social media influencers. Brother Frank does not want to be associated with those sinful social media influencers and their heathenistic Coachella fashion. From the casual bohemian wear of the past to the arseless chaps bonanza of recent years to the even further decline in outfits this year, it seems the influencers descend upon Coachella to parade around in sinful outfits is to create blasphemous content. Yes, I know it's an influencer's job to create content, but holy mother of God, does it need to be done so disrespectfully? I'm with Brother Frank. I've had it with the excessive diamantes, cowboy hats, slutty tie day, faux nylon, animal print, bikini outfits, and reflective shit. Fashion icon Coco Chanel famously said, before you leave the house, look in the mirror and take one thing off. Well, times have changed. For the love of God, influencers look in the mirror and put three things on, starting with pants. In contrast, it seems the celebrities who have real jobs took the good word from the Lord's book, with celebrities like Kendall Jenner, Camila Cabello, and Shawn Mendes following it to a T. All celebrities in attendance were spotted in jeans with a nice top to match, and all seemed to be focused on spending time with friends, listening to music, and perhaps selling some interesting substances. With Groove in the Mood just around the corner, I'm expecting all of Australia to take notes and show up in some God-honoring fashion. Or else. Praise be, Sister N. Ah, Sister Versace Runway with her finger on the fashion pulse. Now let's check back in with Barry Martin to see how he's faring in his attempt to get to Melbourne Airport by public transport. All right, so I've got the app and apparently it's just a quick train. To a tram. To a bus. What? 
what is this? I mean, I'm sure it'll be easy. Barry Tempicotta gave you. Oh. Where's my tray? Does it normally take this long? Barry, it's only been three minutes. What? <laughs> Good luck. Well, Disney is celebrating 100 years in 2023, loved by kids all over the globe. But it's not just children who have a soft spot for Mickey Mouse, with some adults so obsessed with Disney it's akin to a religion. So let's explore this phenomenon with our very own adult Disney fan, Ranthi. I may be Gen Z, but I do have one millennial indulgence, and that is the fact that I I'm a proud Disney adult, okay? We may be cringy, we may be mentally stuck at the age of five, waltzing around castles and wearing silly costumes, but you know what? I don't care. Disney's celebrating 100 years and we should celebrate that, you know? Ignoring like, you know, the rampant capitalism and like the weird dip into fascism and like Nazi propaganda. It's a sleigh company to work for, okay? I got to dress as Goofy every day and it's like, oh, I'm making my little candy. And no, okay? I love that place. Look, I even bought two of the same thing because that's how much I love that place, okay? So maybe next time you're judging Disney adults for like, you know, oh my God, they're so cringy. Why are they crying in front of the castle? Maybe because it's a good castle. <laughs> Fascinating. Well, we're off to a quick break. Hakuna Matata. Well, over to the United Kingdom, where the government is handing out vapes in an attempt to wean a million Brits off smoking cigarettes. So to check in on the state of affairs in the UK, let's cross to our royal correspondent, Princess Anne. Well, hello again. To put it plainly, it's been a shocking time here. Everyone is simply beside themselves about this coronation. I certainly wouldn't be bothering with all this fanfare if it was me getting crowned, which, let's face it, we'd all prefer. So I'm out on the streets of London today. I'm being one with the people, some might say, lining up for a government handout because, well, I've decided to start vaping. Rather than have the steam come out of my ears, I've decided to expel it from my lungs like the dirty people. It's just the stress. I simply cannot handle one more ghastly conversation about carriages or emojis or, worst of all, that horrid quiche they are insistent on serving. I mean, there's an egg shortage in Britain, and of all dishes, he chooses a spinach quiche with a broad beans to serve to 2,000 of the world's leaders and royals. Typical Charles, a bit dry and crusty and soft and wilted inside. No bite, no stick, just a crumbly, mushy, half-baked offering with a soggy old vegetable beside it. But yes, I thought seeing as the government is just handing vapes out these days, I might as well give it a go. Apparently it's the quick fix to end nicotine addictions around the country. It's coming out of taxpayer dollars after all, which means it's basically our money, now that we have to pay tax too, god damn it. If only Mr Rishi Sunak was around to help my poor Auntie Margaret before she chain-smoked herself to death. I mean, she had to do something to death to amuse herself as the spare. It's not like she had a Megan to sit around and cause all kinds of trouble with. Not like, well, don't get me started. I'll need more than vapes to calm me down. And to be honest, I think Auntie Margaret did too. I have heard on the grapevine that your colonial government has actually banned vapes, but I better not mention that here. I think we're all just pretending that vapes are good for you. Oh well, I hope there's not a quiche flavour. Mm, tasty. Now let's get a hit of good news with our bringer of joy, Thursday Eve. <laughs> I bring news. In God's decrepit hellhole that is New York City, they have unfortunately appointed a new leader. Someone who is attempting to extinguish the city's culture of filth and grime. All hail the Rat Tsar. Tsar Kathleen Karate has been elected to eradicate the rat population. The position advertised for someone somewhat bloodthirsty with a swashbuckling attitude. She plans to cut off the rat's food, water, and sources of shelter. She claims the rats don't run the city. I disagree. This is appalling, and I would argue the rats deserve more rights than the people of New York. 
the rats don't commit crime, they clean garbage off the streets, and they even help turtles fight vigilantes sometimes, which is more than what the NYPD do. The one with the title Rats Are needs to empower the rats, rather than feed into the stigma that they spread plague and disease. We just had a pandemic where people did that, and you don't see anyone being crowned a people's R. However, if we are doing people's R's, I'll happily apply. I have multitudes of ideas of how to control the people. All hail Zarina Thursday. Well, moving on, and Google has been scrambling to integrate AI into its software after tech giant Samsung proposed switching its default search engine to Microsoft Bing. Huh, I thought Bing's only use was to search for Google, but it turns out Microsoft's investment in AI search capabilities poses a serious threat to Alphabet, Google's parent company. With advanced generative AI providing answers to all our burning questions, as well as AI being integrated into, well, literally everything, TikTok, Snapchat, prestigious photography competitions, is AI technology always necessary? While some people think robots will revolutionize the workforce, this viral clip circulating on social media says otherwise. <laughs> Mood. I guess even $20 million AI robots get tied up to doing the bare minimum. Well, moving on, and construction firm Porter Davis has been in the news of late for their financial woes after going bankrupt, liquidating their business, and then having to sell part of their company to another firm. With Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews announcing a $15 million rescue package for affected customers, at least we know that if your business fails, Dan will be there to bail you out. But with Porter Davis still in turmoil, let's cross now to our girl who picked in high school and now works in a pyramid scheme for some entrepreneurial advice. You know, I don't know Porter personally, but I do have to say his business model is inspiring. I mean, if you can't afford the 1,700 homes you've promised to clients, going out of business is a perfect thing to do. You don't have to pay the $500 million if you don't have it. It's the perfect legal loophole. In fact, I've made no money, no accountability, the slogan of my new business. I've made it my personal mission to single-handedly eradicate the housing crisis by starting my own housing business. You're welcome. For just a small fee, all your worries will be swept under the rug using the most natural wood materials and locally sourced organic brick, which is essentially mud. I can have your beautiful home ready for you at some point, if I get time. Just simply send me the tiny price of $300,000 in iTunes gift cards and cross your fingers that this is a better option than just renting. If you have any queries or are currently waiting to hear back about your house, don't call me. I won't answer, I don't have a phone. Sign me up. Now let's cross to Barry Martin to see if he made it to the airport. <laughs> that was horrific. Where are we? I think I went the wrong way. They go both ways? How do people live like this? Dad, I'm lost. Send the chauffeur. I think we need the Melbourne Airport Rail. Barry Martin, boy of the people. Now let's see what's coming up after the struggle tonight. We are just a few minutes away from the launch of Love Ireland, a show dedicated to all things Irish and lovish. I'm your host, Infi. And I'm the 51st Shade of Grey. Coming up, Ireland's newfound love affair with US President Joe Biden. Don't you just love the sight of hundreds of people thirsting over an older man? Yeah, there's some serious sugar daddy energy right there. Love Ireland tonight, after the struggle. <sighs> Love a good Irish TV show. Well, over to Belgium now, where a friendly game of Monopoly turned violent recently after neighbours raised a noise complaint with the players. The quibble quickly escalated into a nasty altercation involving a samurai sword and resulted in two men being hospitalised with serious cuts. As a result, Hasbro has introduced a new house rule stating all games must now be supervised by a local police officer. A Monopoly game is about to get underway here in Melbourne with Sergeant Yolanda Arrest in charge of keeping the peace. Let's head over there now. 
<laughs> Hi, guys. Please hand over any weapons you have on you before we roll the dice. Ooh. Foxy, roll to see who goes first. Ah, eight. Oh. Okay. Oh, 11. Yay. Oh, um, but you can go first, Foxy. After all, this is just a very friendly game of Monopoly. <laughs> I want a fair match, no cheating, no abuse. And under no circumstances are you to stab each other with a samurai sword. Understood? Of course. Yeah. Oh, chance. Go to jail. Skip go and do not collect $200. All right, that's it. Put your hands behind your back. And, under, and ah! Ah! the struggle. It's real. 